My name is Mark Desus, and I'm a professor here at Duke University in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I also need to disclose that I'm one of the co-founders of a startup company called 374 Water that is commercializing this technology. Behind me is our pilot supercritical water oxidation reactor. And uh, today we'll do a tour. I'll tell you more about the technology and specifically about the ESTCP treatment, the ESTCP project that we have that is about the treatment of PFAS. Today is actually a little noisy because we're running our system. We're actually treating rinsates uh, that contain PFAS that we receive from a decontamination project. As you can see behind me, the system is built in a 20-foot shipping container. The system is sized to treat approximately one ton of waste per day. That's about 260 gallons. We actually designed the system in 2013. We had funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on a project to demonstrate that supercritical water oxidation can be used to treat fecal waste in countries that lack sanitation. Now with funding from ESTCP, we're focusing on the treatment of PFAS, or the forever chemicals in AFFF, aqueous film firefighting films. So what exactly is supercritical water and how does supercritical water oxidation work? On the left side, you see here the phase diagram of water, and we're all familiar with water as a liquid, or vapor, or as a solid, as ice. It turns out that when you have water above 374 degrees C, or 705 degrees Fahrenheit, and you compress it to greater than 218 times the atmospheric pressure, which is roughly 3200 PSI, water becomes supercritical. It's somewhere hybrid between a gas and a liquid, and it has amazing properties. We can use those properties to do very fast reaction, in particular, supercritical water oxidation. Uh, and the reaction is shown at the bottom here. If you have any sort of organics, including PFAS, and you inject an oxidant, then we're using air. Um, these organics will react and get oxidized to their most elemental form, forming CO2. Um, fluoride, in the case of PFAS, some of it will precipitate as calcium uh, fluoride if there's a hardness or other salts, and we recover the heat of reaction. This process is truly amazing because it is very complete. The reactions are extremely fast. They occur in a matter of seconds, a few seconds, four to 10 seconds, typically. The conversion is uh, nearly complete, uh, and you obtain clean water as uh, your final product, and all the contaminants are mineralized. And um, squo can be very effective for all kinds of organic contaminants, including hazardous waste, 1,4-D, uh, PFAS, uh, sludges, uh, organic uh, contaminants, even the most recalcitrant ones are getting oxidized because it's such a reactive environment. However, there's no reaction byproduct uh, like NOx and SOx because the temperatures are, are low enough to avoid their formation. Another advantage of SQUO is that you can treat liquids without drying them or you can treat flurries. Uh, finally, the process is very scalable. Now to our ESTCP project, ER 205350, uh, which is titled Supercritical Water Oxidation for Complete PFAS Destruction. Our broad objectives are several forms. First of all, we show the treatability of PFAS and demonstrate that we can destroy PFAS in our pilot system and optimize treatment conditions. The second aspect is a techno-economic evaluation that uh, we want to do for typical Department of Defense scenarios. How can we treat rinsates and investigation derived waste in our uh, school unit, in a school system, and evaluate cost at scale. And lastly, promote technology transition uh, so that this technology can be implemented uh, at scale. So what have we done so far? This project started uh, mid-2020. Uh, we have already secured and procured uh, different PFAS waste, some rinsates from actual decontamination equipment and some pure AFFF. And we've successfully 
um, treated uh, some pure P A triple F by uh, diluted first 300 fold and 30 fold. So very concentrated solutions for which we've shown that we can very effectively destroy all the PFAS, irrespective of whether they were long chain or short chain uh, PFAS. Great elimination decrease in total organic fluorine. The gaseous emissions were negligible. Uh, and lastly, that our cost prediction for treatment at scale appear very, very promising. So let's go back to our visits now, and I'll show you more about our system. Today, we're actually running some rinse aids that we received from an actual decontamination operation. This is the material we're running today. We received it from uh, Tyndall Air Force Base. It's actual rinse aid. We have now moved inside the container, and I'm going to show you the equipment. Uh, it's a different day because when the system is at pressure and temperature, we cannot be inside the container for safety reasons. This is one of the high pressure pumps. This is a water pump. Above here, we have a furnace. This is to provide the heat when we start up the system, after which the heat is only provided by uh, the heat of the reaction and the heat of the reaction comes from the feedstock that is being oxidized. Everything that you see is industrial grade uh, to withstand the temperature and the pressures uh, of the system. Again, the pressure is about 220 bars or 3400 PSI. Uh, it's equivalent to balancing a suburban on two quarters. Roughly. Everything is thermally insulated so we can recover uh, the heat behind this large insulated box is a coil of heat exchangers, counter current heat exchangers, where we recover the heat of uh, reaction. The slurry or the waste stream undergoing treatment enters and is preheated in those heat exchangers and then enters the reactor. The reactor is actually just a pipe, a simple pipe at the top of the container. Uh, it's also well insulated, so we actually don't see very much, but it burns the entire length and after the reaction, the heat is recovered in those heat exchanges that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. The phases are then separated. The gases are depressurized to a little back pressure regulator that's located behind here. Uh, and then the liquid gets depressurized through these long capillaries, these coils that we can see here on the ground. And then it's discharged at atmospheric pressure. Up here are a lot of connections for the, uh, the thermocouples to the left and the pneumatic valves to the right. And then this cabinet has all the electrical connections for all the sensors and actuators with the controllers at the top. Here is the high pressure pump. This is a custom piston pump that we have developed that feeds the liquid waste or the slurry into the system at high pressure, roughly 240 bars, or 3,400 PSI. At the end of the process, the treated liquid leaves the system through these PVC pipes and then is then collected in these different tanks. We, of course, take samples at uh, different points in time to analyze the performance of the system. The gases come out through the pipes at the very top and we're going to go and have a look at the gas sensors that we have installed here. Of course everything is connected to our programmable logic controller for data acquisition. We have sensors for carbon dioxide, for residual oxygen, we're measuring the volatile organics as well as uh, many other parameters. And here is our control room from which we drive the system. We have a custom HMI, and um, on the left side, you can see a screen that has an intelligent data software. It allows us to look in real time at different trends and react to what we see. Uh, the process is fully instrumented with well over 100 inputs and outputs. Everything is uh, computer controlled. Uh, and this is where all the sensors connect as well.